Welcome to uh, H5P Symposium Day 2. We had a really successful day yesterday. Thank you to those of you who were able to join yesterday and to those who weren't able to join yesterday. Welcome to today. We hope today is going to be um, as productive as uh, yesterday was. Uh, to start off today, I'd like to um, acknowledge that UBC, which is hosting the symposium, is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. As we are meeting virtually today, I'd also like to acknowledge that, they, that here in the Lower BC mainland, we are also often also on the unceded territories of the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh, and other Coast Salish peoples. You may be joining us from different areas, and I'd like to take a moment to appreciate, consider, and give respect to the lands in which we are situated. I appreciate the land where I am as it provides me with the opportunities. When I acknowledge being on the territory of the Musqueam people, it is rooted in an understanding that I, as a resident of Vancouver and a member of UBC, am privileged to be learning and working on territory that is not my own. And as we did yesterday, I would like you to, I'd like to invite you to acknowledge the uh, territories that you are on um, in your respective parts of the world. Now, as a roadmap for today, we're going to start off with a panel discussion. In the next hour and a half, we're going to be looking at creating H5P projects with students. We're going to be looking at, uh, we've got quite an experienced panel here today, uh, going from students up to uh, learning designers, all who have had extensive experience with H5P. And we're going to look at different ways in which we can make H5P more accessible, how to manage your H5P library. We hopped on tags and metadata yesterday, trying to help people with organization. We're gonna be hearing some other people, some tips and tricks that they've had about organization. We're going to be hearing from students who have created H5P content and students who have consumed H5P concept, content. Um, and so we're going to be taking a, a good hard look at that in uh, the panel discussion. Then from 10.30 to 12 p.m., we're going to be doing the studio session, which is uh, getting further into H5P. Uh, we're going to be looking at more advanced um, uh, options, drag and drop. Um, we're going to be looking at branching interactive videos. We can look at branching scenarios. Um, and so we'll get ourselves in the weeds a little bit over there. Then between 12 and 1, we're going to have a break. And then from 1 o'clock until 3, 3 plus o'clock, we're going to have um, the opportunity for you to come along and um, practice these things that we've learned in the studio sessions with one-on-one uh, -on -one support with uh, specialists, just to try and help get you started. And so this brings us to the panel discussion this morning. And I'm going to hand it over to Kaylee quickly. So we heard yesterday about how you uh, about how H5P is a flexible tool with lots of remixing possibilities. So we're going to ask you to be uh, uh, treating us, Simon and I, a bit like our H5P elements today in that we are going to have to be uh, a little bit flexible and remixing. We are going to play the role of both moderator of this panel and panelists. And we're kind of going to be switching back and forth um, as to who's doing that. So I'd like to start by introducing our first panelist. Our first panelist is Siobhan McPhee. Siobhan is an associate professor of teaching in the Department of Geography here at the University of British Columbia. And she also serves as the Associate Dean of Equity, Innovation and Strategy. Siobhan has used H5P to create and embed interactive content in her first year geography course. She has used H5P in several creative ways. So she's used it as a means to create active learning opportunities for her students in a large course. She's used it to make use of blended learning approach to teaching, as well as to help keep her students engaged while doing asynchronous classwork. So Siobhan, I would like to ask you to quickly share with us what are your favorite or most used H5P content types? Thanks, Kaylee. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. I don't think I have a, a particular favorite because it really depends on the exercise. I think just overall, I really appreciate that um, it enables me, the H5P enables me to present students with a whole range of different um, interactive elements. Uh, so from, you know, uh, getting them to at the end to create a summary by moving phrases around to multiple choice to 
What's great also is the videos with the questions that pop up. So it really comes down to what is the objective that I'm trying to achieve in a particular exercise. And I try in each week to mix them up so that it's not a constant uh, throughout. So I would say just the general ethos of the, how interactive each of the tools is rather than any one particular one. Great, thank you. Our next panelist is uh, Stephen Barnes, who's an associate professor of teaching in the Department of Psychology and uh, the director of the undergraduate program in neuroscience here at UBC. Stephen has made use of the open source part of H5P and has developed a new non-linear remixable interactive approach to delivering course content called the Tapestry Tool. And Tapestry Tool uses H5P as its engine. Stephen also makes use of H5P in his massive open online courses that reach over 120,000 students annually. So Stephen, I'd like to ask you the same type of questions. What are your favorite and most used H5P content types? Uh, thank, thanks, Simon. Um, so uh, there's quite a few, as Siobhan said. Uh, it does depend in, to a large degree on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, I can tell you what, what I think is the coolest H5P widget. It's the 360 virtual tour, which I think I touched on uh, yesterday as well. I just popped that in the chat for people. Um, that I haven't used very much myself, but I, I really admire people who have, for example, for virtual field trips. I think it's a great widget that was created. Um, yeah, um, so that's my favorite uh, conceptually wise. I think it, I think it allows for uh, hybrid learning instances that wouldn't otherwise be possible. Thanks very much. I agree. I'm trying to think how I can use that one in my course, but that's great. Thank you very much. Our next panelist is Parm Gill. Parm is a learning designer in the Educational Technology Support Unit in the Faculty of Education. She has a background in graphic design, multimedia, and print and web production. She's been working on online and blended courses for over 20 years since WebCT's days and is also a graduate of the UBC Master of Education Technology program. Parm, do you have a favorite or most used H5P content type? Absolutely, I do have a favorite. Um, I really like the timeline. And the reason why I liked it, um, when I used it when I was a student in the MET program. So um, I, it, it was really nice and um, to put together my ideas instead of using like an essay or a written assignment. So I really enjoyed that. But what I really like about the timeline is that it can give you um, a lot of visual information that you can't get from like a list of dates and tables. So you can see like events that are clustered together. Um, and I also like that when users are going through a timeline, it's more of an organic exploration, sort of like what we would normally look on like on the um, internet, but it's a curated exploration. So their students are still having the enjoyment of looking around and exploring but they're not gonna stumble across misinformation. Um, and there's a lot of tools that I really like, but I really like that one. Thank you very much. Next, we have uh, Novak Rojic as the manager of web services at UBC Center for Technology and Learning Technology. Uh, Novak is a web strategist and leading web projects that emphasize content sharing and republishing. Um, this has included leading the team developing UBC's open h5p hub novak i'm not sure if you have a favorite h5p content type if you don't have a favorite h5p content type is there something about h5p that you find particularly attractive um, over say any of the other types of um, uh, formative assessment tools or open source tools that you've worked with uh, thank you simon well uh, that's a great question and uh, i have to say i have not used h5p in a kind of in a type of environment that you most of you are using it uh, i'm coming to it to, from the sort of technology perspective and we have installed and implemented the h5p on top of the wordpress and actually i think that's a kind of the answer to the part of your question uh, i could think how the h5p compares to the wordpress's plugins so while there are some similarities i have to say even though i'm a huge kind of fan of wordpress that H5P sort of make these sort of boundaries even much smaller and it's a much easier system to quickly master and, and use. Uh, and I think that's why there is a huge attraction because 
because how simple it is to use it in a class environment. So those are my just sort of initial impressions. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, our next panelist is Alina Cook. Alina is a first year PhD student in organic chemistry at Stanford University. She completed her Bachelor of Science at UBC in the Honors Chemical Biology program in 2021. And during her time at UBC, Alina worked with me to help improve the online textbook for UBC's custom first year chemistry textbook. As part of that work, Alina developed new practice questions using H5P, and she helped improve, to, uh, improve upon existing questions based on student feedback. She also, previous to that, had been part of the course, so has also had the experience of consuming questions from a student perspective. So Alina, did you have a favorite or most used content type when you were making or using H5P questions? Yeah, so I'd say my favorite content type primarily from making is the branching scenario questions. So that's kind of like the choose your own adventure style problem where it's a super useful way for students to kind of get feedback right away and immediately correct any misconceptions they might have about a question. Um, so that's not a question that I ever experienced as a student, but was one that I was able to design for the textbook once I had finished the course. Thank you very much, Alina. So now we have uh, Kaylee Johnson, who's an Associate Professor of Teaching in the Department of Chemistry at UBC. Kaylee worked with Professor Glenn Samus in chemistry to author a custom online textbook for UBC's first year chemistry course. Kaylee and Glenn were looking for ways to incorporate interactive questions and interactive videos, and CTLT suggested considering H5P. Kaylee has integrated hundreds of H5P questions that are integrated into the online textbook and has taken a special interest in creating interactive videos. Um, what are your favorite and most used uh, content types, Kaylee? Well, as you might be able to guess on that introduction, my favorite type is probably interactive videos, just because I really like um, how it's able to guide a student through a question step by step, and then based uh, and then ask them to actually give input at each step, and then branch to give extra explanation right when they need it and only if they need it. So that's my favorite, but my most used is maybe a less exciting content type, but the question set is probably my workhorse, just because it uh, lets you integrate a bunch of different question types together and it gives students the type of um, practice questions that they're often looking for. Our last panelist slash moderator of the panel um, in his flexible role is Simon Lalio, who is an assistant professor of teaching in psychology at UBC. Simon recently, with the aid of a BC campus grant, created over 1,000 interactive H5P elements for use in the Pressbook instance of the OpenStax psychology book. Simon and I are now exploring the pedagogical benefits of branching interactive videos on student learning, and our early results are demonstrating that memory ben uh, the memory benefits of using branch of interactive videos with spoken feedback over rereading material or watching a passive video or having interactive videos where the feedback is simple text. Simon, do you have a favorite and mo or most used type of H5P content? Thanks, Katie. Um, the most used, I suppose, is the question set with multiple choice questions. And this is just because that is what most often students find in intro to psych courses. And so trying to give them a lot of practice at these uh, types of questions that they're going to be facing throughout their university career. The ones that I enjoy the most are these branching interactive videos um, because they allow a fair amount of creativity while um, embedding course content and sort of you know, making, making learning a little bit more fun for students. And also it allows you to place the student in, um, in a, a space of authority uh, using these branching interactive uh, videos where someone can ask questions of them rather than um, them having to ask questions of someone else. So those are the two that I probably use uh, the most. Wonderful, thanks, Simon. So. As we move uh, into the panel, I'd like to invite anybody to jump in and add questions in via the chat and we will sprinkle them in as we can and anything that we don't get to while we're going through some of our prepared questions we will um, be have time for at the end. So please feel free anytime you have a question to pop it in the chat. To get us started, I'm wondering, Stephen, 
Could you please tell us what role H5P has played in your course? Has you used it to replace something, enhance something, or create something altogether new in terms of your course? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, as you know, I, I use Tapestry Tool in my courses. So I'm basically using H5P as, as individual nodes. Um, so what I've actually done and I think has been quite successful is have, have students actually create H5P, H5P widgets themselves as, a, as either group projects or individual projects that they, collab, um, that they can or cannot cl collaborate on. And then uh, th that would be part of their course grade is basically an assessment of those widgets. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Kaylee? Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting. Yeah, it absolutely does. Thank you so much. I'm wondering, Simon, because I know you use H5P in a bit of a different way, given that Stephen's using it in the tapestry tool. Could you answer the same question? So what role has H5P played in your course and um, what's it allowed you to do, replace, enhance, or create? Absolutely. Um, I really have enjoyed, I like using H5P for its flexibility to embed it right in the spaces that students are learning. Uh, for instance, trying to use something like Canvas quiz after reading a passage, a student might have to leave part of the textbook that they're um, working in to go and fill out a quiz and then come, come back. Or they would have to read more and then do a quiz and then go back. Where H5P really just allows me to embed some, some questions right after a section that they've read. They can test their knowledge and their understanding and then um, brush up on anything that... Um, that they feel that they may need that they haven't quite understanding what I hoping what I hoping achieving what um, uh, what Mark McDaniel was talking about yesterday increasing their meta is it meta memory uh, about knowing what they don't know now and making their studying a little bit more effective so um, I haven't really used it to replace anything but I've used it to enhance the course materials and students engagement with the course materials while giving them practice and hopefully increasing these things like meta memory. Great, thank you. I, anytime we're using a new tool like this, there's always a learning curve and it's often tricky too to be picking a tool because you kind of need to learn how to use it to know whether it's gonna work in your context. I'm wondering, Siobhan, can you tell us for yourself, how did you find the learning curve for using H5P and why did you decide to stick with it? Oh, it's a few years ago now, so... Um... <laughs> Uh, the learning curve, I, I don't think it, it was any one moment because like I just shared the virtual tour which happened with COVID and I've been using um, H5P embedded within tapestry like Stephen for a number of years. So I think it, it kind of, um, and I was very lucky to be working as you, Kaylee, also said with some amazing RAs, um, were really supportive and then obviously the H5P team. So I, what I do like about it is it's pretty, you know, um, it's pretty forgiving in that, you know, you make a mistake. It's, it's very much a WordPress space. So if, if, you know, if you have any experience working with Canvas or any WordPress based um, platform or um, structure, it's, uh, yeah, it's pretty forgiving and uh, allows you to edit and experiment. Um, so, why did I stick with it? Honestly, just the feedback from students. It was incredible to see how much they enjoyed um, being able to um, feel. And I will say the one thing that I know uh, we're still working on is embedding it, you know, it within Canvas so that we can remove the extra step of um, Canvas quizzes, because in order to include it in the grade book, that's still a step that I have to do. Um, but that hasn't been a, a huge obstacle. Uh, but they really like the fact that that they are not just reading content, but actively um, engaging with it uh, and, uh, and answering questions. Yeah. Thank you. And Alina, as a student who was working alongside faculty to help create H5P questions. How did you find it was for you in terms of a learning curve of using H5P? Did you find you were able to jump right in? Did it take you a while? Do you remember? Yeah, I think, I mean, given I joined working with you on H5P in my second year of my undergrad, I'd never worked with any type of software before, not even Canvas software. I feel like it was very intuitive to use, even for someone who had no experience at all. Um, and after, you know, a 
you showing me a couple of times kind of how to use it and you know the way that you can design problems. I was also designing problems on my own um, and leading the de designing of the questions and found it completely user friendly. And I was also able to, to do that despite having no prior experience in it. Wonderful. Now, we've heard from a couple of the panelists about some of the um, benefits of H5P and why they've stuck with it and used it in their courses. Um, Stephen, I'm wondering, what have you found that using H5P has allowed you to do that other tools have not? Yeah, good question. Um, so, well, I mean, in terms of interactives, I think it's 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 great in that way. Um, it's open source, so you can and it's reusable, so you can actually find widgets that have already been made online and then embed them in your course, um, download them and, and embed them in your course. I think that's a, a, a that's a key component is its reusability and the, the ability to share content that you've created with other people um, who would like to use that content as well. It it basically builds the community out more and and H five P is a growing community. I remember attending their conference, um, their H five P conference conference um, in Australia several years ago. And then it was just starting to pick up speed. And, and now I see it at full steam. Um, th their developers are great, by the way, uh, very supportive and easy to reach out to. Um, from your point of view, in terms of thinking of things that H5P can do that other tools can't, I imagine that you've worked a lot with um, helping faculty pick whether H5P is the right tool for them or something like Articulate Storyline. Can you tell us about when you think H5P is the right tool for um, a faculty or staff member and what how it compares to other tools um, and how they might be able to make that choice of whether it's the right tool for them? All right. Um, I think the biggest thing comparing it to other tools is the learning curve. Uh, um, things like Articulate Storyline, or even if you have a whole bunch of other tools online um, that are, you know, different websites and you have to remember different passwords, it's really nice that H5P is all in one spot. Um, the learning curve is really um, not, not much compared to the other tools that people can use. Um, Articulate is quite expensive um, and it is more robust and I, it, I think it's good for developing like e-learning modules that are really well planned out that you plan on keeping for a number of years. But I have noticed as soon as the software gets updated, sometimes it impacts your stories. H5P has been pretty stable. Um, I've been using it for a number of years and the updates haven't really impacted um, the way that the interactions function. Um, it's accessible for most um, interaction types and that's always indicated on their website. So I like that. The interactions are quick to make. You can adapt them. Um, you can embed them and take them into like Word, WordPress or in your Canvas course. Um, I guess it would really depend on whether they want their content to be secure, then I would say, use something like Articulate. Um, but um, for the most part, faculty that I've worked with that have been introduced to H5P, um, they, they've gone off and they've produced amazing stuff and I've just been blown away. So I find it's something that people really adapt to easily. Um, so talking about, thank you very much, Pam. Talking about learning, uh, learning curves and the like, there's a question from the chat saying, what is one thing um, you wish someone had told you about H5P before jumping in and building activities? Um, I think I'd like to ask this question to Siobhan and then over to Kaylee. So Siobhan, using these um, uh, very sophisticated instances of H5P, is there something you wish someone had told you before you started diving in? I saw that question, Simon, and I was thinking about it. <laughs> Again, I guess maybe I it, uh, maybe I have a short term memory at the moment, but I'm trying to think back of when I started um, using it, and and uh, I think uh, it's hard because I, I I take the approach to educational technology of um, it's not a tool that that um, is there to to achieve a specific goal for me. 
it's something that's there for me to play around with and um, to experiment with to meet my my learning objectives. So I've written about this. I preach about it no end. Anyone who knows me well that we need to stop treating um, educational technology as like a stat like this is the answer. It's more how you use it, not what it'll achieve for you. So as with any of these tools, I would say the same about H5P. Just um, not to be afraid to play around, but to go in with, you know, we've all talked about some of our favorite question, uh, types of questions, types of ways of presenting the information in H5P. I would say like before you even start using it, like be very clear about what you're trying to achieve with using it. Um, and I think that's clear with all of us here on the panel. We had a very specific aim or objectives, a few of them when, when we started using the tool. So I think if you're just find it shiny and, and fancy and that it won't work for you, you have to have a very clear objective for you and for your students. So that's what I'd say. That that's a fantastic answer. And like I, I will admit to being guilty to seeing H5P and all the different content types and seeing it as something shiny and new. And when creating content, getting a little bit frustrated because I couldn't use it in the way that I'd envisioned it because I actually hadn't sat down and thought, well, what am I trying to achieve with this? And then doing some planning. So I, I would love to echo that statement. Um, with a lot of things with H5P, um, knowing why you're using it, when to use it, and then planning plays such a key role. Um, thanks, Siobhan. That's a great answer. Um, Kaylee, so in what context do you choose to use a tool other than H5P and why? And, you know, we spoke about Canvas quizzes. Why not just use Canvas quizzes for everything? Yeah, so I suppose I primarily, in terms of making questions for my students, use uh, H5P for formative assessment and Canvas quizzes for summative assessment. So I would pick a tool other than H5P if what I'm after is something really grades-based where I also really want to know like what has each student answered um, in detail rather than say just like a score or something. Um, and so I still find Canvas quizzes helpful, but what I like about H5P is that it allows me to take a question and embed it right where that learning opportunity is so that a student can practice it immediately after and be able to see, did I understand what I just read? Whereas a Canvas quiz is some separate thing that's all sitting together and it kind of has this um, extra stress about it as it's a quiz. So to me, H5P takes that away and I'm able to have the flexibility of placing it wherever I want. One of the things that I still find Canvas quizzes very helpful for is because in chemistry we have some computation, I find that anything where I'm wanting to mark with complex numbers or set up a question where say the numbers are changing um, for each time that you see the question and it's marking with a formula or something, that's something that H5P can't currently do. And it's also something that um, H5P isn't great at smart interpretation of numbers like scientific notation and stuff. So if I wanted to be asking that sort of thing, I would still use something like Canvas quizzes, but for quick conceptual checks, um, and like in situ learning, H5P is what I find most powerful. Thank you very much. You mentioned one of the benefits of H5P is that it can um, be embedded right into where the student is learning. And obviously feedback is a key important about that. And we went on about how to do feedback for a number of the H5P content types, but some H5P content types don't allow for detailed feedback. What do you do when that happens, Kaylee? Yeah, so usually if, if I can, for the question I'm trying to ask, if there's a content type in H5P that allows for feedback, I use that one. But in the times where there is a content type that is really the right one for the question I want to ask, but it doesn't offer feedback, um, Alina helped me look through all the student feedback on our, our questions that we had for H5P. One of the things we found was that when we were using those questions without feedback, students were getting frustrated because they wanted to know, well, what is the full solution or what are more details? So what we ended up doing for those types of questions is we still asked them using the feedback or using the content type that didn't have feedback because that was the best tool for the question. But we ended up adding um, an accordion right after the question that had the detailed solution and um, where a student could pop it out and see lots of explanations of why that each one was the answer or why it wasn't the answer. And they seemed to be much more satisfied that they then had access to that um, after the question. 
Okay, I'm going to just um, pop in quickly, which I see Paul from the chat has a question. I'm wondering, Novak, I don't know if you know the answer to this. The question was, can H5P interface with web work? As far, and web work being something that is much better for computational type questions. As far as I know, the answer is no, but I'm wondering, Novak, if you know more than that. Uh, I was just answering the previous uh, Paul's question, uh, which is around the integration, actually the XAPI or collecting stats about the different uh, skills or per student performance and so, so on. Uh, in, in about integration with uh, web work, to be honest, I, I'm not uh, familiar with it. I don't think there is. Uh, a potential for that, but I'm, I might be wrong. Uh, so I have to say I'm I'm really not uh, I I don't know that. Uh, but going back to to uh, Paul's previous question around the uh, so uh, I just want to say that most uh, H5P modules are X API ready, and if you look at the inventory of all the uh, H5P modules that are available on H5P.org or modules that people have you know written outside of H5P.org, uh, there is usually uh, a place that it says if it's a XAPI ready or not. And XAPI is a, is a protocol that allows integration, uh, basically just collecting any sort of information that you would like to keep from a student's interaction with your, with your module and then store it uh, typically outside of H5P, which is a sort of a great idea. And XAPI as a concept uh, has been you know, popular for, for quite a few years. Uh, simply because it allows institutional sort of a third party kind of or uh, independent uh, learning locker or learning record store to store critical information from various sources. So, for example, if you're running a course in Canvas and you're collecting certain data there and now you are implement you're having an H5P work or, or doing something in WordPress, you may be able to collect uh, all that information in a consistent format and store the key kind of performance indicator in, in the same way in the same database and then analyze them in a consistent way so you can actually have uh, just apples and not mixing apples and oranges that we do uh, quite often. Uh, so, so again, it, uh, its system is designed to support that. And again, going back to web work, it is possible, but perhaps you know, the part of the solution could be there. I'd say I'm really not that familiar, but again, the XAPI is a concept is implemented in H5P and uh, it does require quite a bit of custom development to get there. So it would be great to have sort of institutional approach to, to find kind of typical patterns in terms of collecting data, what kind of programs that are professional programs, what kind of attributes do we have and that we need to store how similar they are so we can sort of implement a solution that could satisfy the most needs on campus. Fantastic. Lucas, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, sorry to jump in, Novak. I was wondering also if you could speak to the current state of H5P, so not um, with custom coding, et cetera, and how much data can be gathered from it. So just kind of the, for the average user right now who jumps in, um, what data they're able to get. Well, right now, basically, the UBC's H5P instance as as of today, it has been implemented uh, so that we do not, uh, basically the intention is to create modules that you can reuse elsewhere. So uh, the, even though it is possible, right now we do not encourage users, uh, actually let's, let's kind of put the roles here. So we have an instructor role and a student role. Um, instructors can create content as well as students. So everyone with a valid CWL or UBC authentication can actually uh, log in and create content. Uh, in order for data to be stored, the consumers of the content have, have to also be logged in. Right now, uh, we don't encourage that, even though it is entirely possible. And then depending on how the modules uh, have been implemented, some of them sort of support data collection, some of them don't, but whatever was originally sort of implemented within the given module, that will be available. Uh, but again, our intention with the current uh, state of H5P at UBC is not to use it simply because uh, we have to take one step at a time. And the original intention was to develop the modules and then host them elsewhere, Canvas, uh, UBC blogs, any other platform 
where you can embed content, students can, can sort of consume it, but the intention was that data is not being stored. So uh, theoretically, what could happen, which might be a little bit confusing, uh, so just a heads up on there, is that somehow some students may actually log into the H5B, even though it's highly unlikely. So if you create a module and paste it and put it in your Canvas course, uh, students, uh, as Simon was saying, it will be kind of an in integral part of, of your course notes, of your course content. So there won't be a specific page to go to do your quiz or, or interactivity. So that's that's a beauty of H5P that, that flow. So they will see that, you know, module, they'll do what they need to do and they'll continue reading the text. So that's the kind of intended purpose. If the student somehow figure out the way where the content is coming from and find the h5p.ubc.ca, they theoretically could log in and then their responses will be recorded. Uh, if we ever want to do it, and I guess, you know, as the community at UBC develops, we are totally open to, to, you know, to feedback. And then we have to figure out what would be the best way. Would that be the natives H5P ability to store some of the content? Or should we invest time into developing XAPI uh, integration and, and store data into some sort of learning record store? So that's the, you know, Thanks. so that, that's the question in front of us. And I think at this phase, I think it's still early to perhaps both, we don't know, uh, but that's something to be kind of worked on in the future. Thank you. Uh, Novak, I'm gonna keep with you. Um, if we're thinking about future-proofing ourselves and, and wanting to make things as easy for ourselves as possible. I know I'm terrible with organizing my H5P library. It's just a bit of a mess. Do you have any pro tips on how to keep an H5P library organized? Uh, so again, we have implemented the, I'll just quickly go through the to kind of UBC's implementation of H5P. So while for the most part, it is just H5P out of the box, we've already done a few things that are specific to UBC's implementation. Uh, one way to, so I'll start with the things that, that we've done. So obviously there is CWL, which is, you know, UBC's kind of unique authentication. So it is easy to, you know, find a place and log in without having to remember yet another pass password. Uh, additionally, we've seen that some instances, hyp.org and a few others do have a discipline list. So there is over, I think around 1400 disciplines, uh, kind of scientific and social, basically pretty much the whole social and uh, engineering studies have been sort of divided into the, this huge list of disciplines. So we've tried to, to implement that rather than having people kind of tagging their content, which usually becomes more of a notebook rather than a database. Uh, this way, if they start typing a certain thing there will be a discipline that starts with those few letters and that they can choose from the list. I can demonstrate that later. Uh, so we thought that was a great addition. And uh, for example, that could be a filter uh, that where, where you can, when looking at your content, sort by, by the discipline and search for certain disciplines if you have you know, things that are belonging to, to multiple disciplines. But that's definitely not the, the easy way to organize your libraries. Uh, so we've also... Uh, implemented a couple of changes into how you choose the license. Some of them are live, some of them are not yet. So we are encouraging the, the basically Creative Commons license and that's the default license uh, within the HYP. Uh, so to, uh, and then what, another important consideration was it took us quite a long time to understand the nature of HYP and how uh, the modules has been sort of managed within a system. And apparently, uh, that's one of the kind of per, of the of the of the you know, HYP attributes that are not really perfect. So the if we so and just to cut the long story short, we had to run one instance of H5P for the for the whole of UBC. If we wanted to make an instance for let's say psychology that was part of the larger instance for arts and so on, we could quickly run into dozens and dozens of different H5P instances at UBC. Uh, that would be kind of a nightmare to manage, uh, simply because there is no easy way to update all the modules at once. So you have to kind of manually or close to doing it manually update your modules. 
And the consequence of that is that we are going, we are going to end up with the th you know, thousands of users within the same instance. And that's why what Simon is saying is kind of critical uh, to sort of, to be, to, we thought about that. So another thing we have implemented is the editor role. So right now we have the faculty groups. So every faculty, uh, faculty support unit has the ability to see the, the, all, all of the people that are contributing within that faculty and they could you know, run certain stats there. They could uh, you know, do quality control or advice or, or kind of just collect names so that offer you know, workshops and, and whatever. But uh, that's, uh, that's the kind of one way to organize content. Um, now we are looking into organizing ad hoc groups because we realize that just around faculties is not enough. So we need to be more granular in terms of the organization. And similarly, once we get to the, on, on a personal level, we can totally see the need of sort of organizing libraries for, for one person, but also perhaps a shared libraries in the future where multiple people can have access to. Uh, also, uh, one thing to mention is that for the reasons of, uh, I guess, compatibility across the multiple platforms, and as you know, H5P can run standalone, that it can run as a part of either WordPress or Drupal or Canvas. So they had to make some calls and kind of really keep it uh, the core not really integrated within the host platform. So, so to explain that better, H5P is not your typical WordPress plugin. It's just really another application that is pretty black boxed and put within the WordPress. And from that perspective, it is actually quite difficult to get in there and change the code, but we are doing that. And uh, I would love to basically uh, just share that on the h5p.open.ubc website, you can find the page called Roadmap. It's under About, I will share the link. Oh, thanks, Simon. Um, so there we already have, I think, seven or eight features that community has requested so far. Some of them, actually one of them is in progress, the rest are pending. And pending means basically we are kind of just negotiating what is the first thing that we should do and, uh, you know, prioritizing things so that you know we can kind of move forward and again like being able to to have a library where you can find content and perhaps share with others it's it will be a great feature it's just the matter of what we hit first brilliant thank you very much i had that um roadmap uh, ready to go because listening to what you're saying i know that you are very responsive and want to hear what what um at least the ubc community would like to have so thank you very much for that um, I see a couple of comments from the, the chat talking about tags often help with um, keeping things organized, though um, it would be great to have some metadata standards to encourage reuse for tags. And then some other people have come up with some, Rie actually came up with a great suggestion saying that um, having a consistent title of your H5P component helps. So have course title, module title, and project title. Uh, these are all excellent ways of having your uh, helping keep your H5P library organized. We've got uh, two more questions under this theme of getting started. And so, um, Stephen and Siobhan, I'm going to throw it out to you two. Um, have you taken any considerations um, to make your H5P elements that you author as accessible as possible? And any tips for what to keep in mind in terms of, of making accessible content? Um. Can you define what you mean by accessible? Um, content that is, for instance, uh, screen reader, um, screen reader friendly. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, well, okay. Two things. Uh, one is a, a broad. Uh, I believe generally that um, this is not the specifics of accessible tech accessibility, but what H5P allows you to do, as we've all been talking about, is to present information in different ways and to have different types of questions. And that in itself is um, addressing different student needs because students have different ways of learning and different ways of engaging. So I would say that in itself is an accessibility um, plus, allowing students to engage in different ways. To the specifics of it, uh, the virtual tour um, that I created, will it was created because of COVID, but it made me realize in the past I'd had to adapt 
various field trips to meet the requirements of some students that I had that had uh, accessibility issues. But I realized with the um, the H5P virtual tour that that addresses that concern. Um, and so, you know, I can thank COVID for that. Uh, but that is the ability that, you know, we can offer different types of um, interactive materials, some that are in person and with H5P, some that students can do on their own. In this case, um, it's uh, the ability to Go, go on a on a field trip virtually, yeah. But I and you know then to other types of accessibility. No, that there's definitely things I want to explore, but those are the two points that I'd raise. Fantastic! I love that idea of the virtual tour, making making these types of things more accessible. So thank you, thank you for that. Um, Stephen, do you have anything? Any other uh, additional considerations? Yeah, um, well, every H5P widget um, has accessibility, alt, alt text available and other accessibility features. Um, I just popped in the link almost simultaneously with Emily, um, a link to the accessibility uh, of each H5P widget. Um, it's a breakdown maintained by the H5P team. Um, so you can see from that list, for example, which, which widgets are, are accessible, for example, to screen readers and other things. Um, another accessibility concern, obviously, is bandwidth. Um, so people who have low bandwidth internet, we have to be mindful of that. A lot of students don't have the high-speed internet that other people do. Um, that's an accessibility feature issue as, as with anything. So, you know, if you're doing something that's, <clears throat> if you're ever doing something that's high high bandwidth like video, um, especially high resolution video, it's always good to, you know, maintain a copy of the script uh, for the video if, if there's dialogue on the same page as a downloadable file. I think that's really important for accessibility for students. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's a great answer. And that made me that the, the, the question of bandwidth also reminded me of uh, using certain programs that have a uh, sort of adaptive bandwidth features. I think Cultura is able to adapt the quality of the video that gets sent through um, depending on, on the available uh, bandwidth. Um, having asked that question, I know that the H5P uh, Kitchen, um, which is uh, sort of run by BC Campus and Alan Levine has a fair amount on accessibility. So there's a link over there searching for all of the um, uh, articles on accessibility over there. So we will post these and those other links on the symposium website. Um, Siobhan, I'd like to go back to you for the last question and sort of getting started with H5P. Um, have you used H5P more or differently in the time since uh, instruction moved primarily online? You've spoken a little bit about that, how COVID has, has sort of made you rethink these things. And um, are you going to continue to use it in the same way as we go back to in-person? Um, well, I actually started using uh, Tapestry and H5P uh, long before the pandemic. And the, the idea was, um, as I said, uh, for me, what's really important is kind of engaging students in, in active learning. Um, and uh, rather than just, you know, what I had done originally was having them do group activities in the classroom, I was moving more towards a, a blended model. So having my courses, so students would do some of the work um, before they came to class, and then we would use the class time to actually really engage and, and they would already have had the opportunity to have had uh, interacted with the material. Uh, so that's really how I used it uh, in, in the pandemic. The only difference was the the face-to-face -face element was on Zoom. Um, the one big difference I would say is, is the, the virtual tour uh, that came out of the online teaching. Uh, so moving back into, I, I won't be teaching, well, we'll see when this course will be taught again, the first year course, but um, I certainly intend to keep the same model of the blended where the students engage with the content prior to coming to class and then we we engage together um, in, co in conversation and discussion and as I said uh, I I will definitely keep the uh, this year I gave my students my first year students last term the option of doing the um, virtual or doing the in-person 
And I probably had about a third that did the virtual, some because they were not in Vancouver um, and some because they, uh, for different reasons. But uh, so I think I will continue to do that. Um, and, uh, you know, it, again, it gives students autonomy and lets them feel like they have a say in, in the way that they're engaging and learning. Thanks, Siobhan. Um, I, I see a couple questions from the chat that I just wanted to um, address. So someone asked, can someone speak a little bit about the support you've all had? Some faculties have a lot of support and others do not. Um, so from my own experience in terms of getting started with H5P, I had a TLEF grant from UBC to be creating an online textbook. And so it was through that that I was able to receive some support through the Faculty of Science um, IT department, so through Skylight. So Skylight was able, and my own home department, uh, through the funding that I received, were able to help me get my own instance of WordPress up and um, install the H5P plugin and get that all set up. Um, and that part is now completely taken care of, given that Novex team has set up for everyone at UBC to be able to access and author H5P um, at UBC. So in terms of actually learning how to make H5P content and that sort of side of it, that was all just self-study since H5P.org does have a lot of good documentation um, as to how to get started. Um, and that's also why we wanted to run the symposium today was to offer some of that support. Um, I'm wondering, Siobhan or Simon or Steven, do, and did any of you receive support um, in terms of getting started with H5P in a similar way um, that you wanted to share? Well, um, it's my continued frustration and, and, and in my new role as Associate Dean, it's like it, there is very little support um, for innovative uh, approaches to teaching and learning at UBC aside from a TLEF. And yes, I did receive a TLEF. Otherwise, there's no way I would have been able to do most of the work that I did. And um, TLEF and also as, you know, Stephen and I and Simon and, and Kaylee, we were, uh, well, you are, but um, I was a, um, a member, a faculty member in Vantage, and that also gave me some um, some support in terms of um, coming up with alternative uh, ways, especially with uh, different types of learners and learners for whom English is an additional language. So, yeah, unfortunately, that's the reality that this is, uh, it's great that, you know, what the, it's amazing what Stephen has accomplished with Tapestry and, and then others with H5P, including your textbook, Kaylee, because it means that the you know, Novak and others um, and Aiden on Stephen's Tapestry team are supported through the various TLEFs that we get, which means that we can offer them to other instructors and other faculty members and students, of course, but there, there really isn't a firm, um, there isn't a proper infrastructure at UBC for supporting um, innovative technology and teaching and learning. Um, I, I suppose I can speak briefly as well. Um, I, I had an external grant from BC campus um, who were looking at trying to create, uh, increase um, the use of OER and H5P, um, partly uh, in, inspired by the work of some of the colleagues, including yourself, Kaylee, here at UBC. And so I had um, the support of BC campus who had a Pressbooks instance um, up and running for me. And uh, they installed the H5P in the press books, which was fantastic. Um, and so that's, you know, I was able to focus then on just using the content as well. And so I, I was very lucky um, that I've had that, but I'm also very grateful now that we have um, uh, Novak and his team have, have spun, spun the, the UBC service up with the H5P instance on that. Great. Thank you, Siobhan and Simon, for sharing about the support you'd received as well. Um, Another question that I saw from the chat was asking about how feasible it would be to extend H5P to include in-class interaction. Um, in terms of, I'm not sure if this is quite, Paul, I think you asked this question. I'm not quite sure if this is what you're getting at, but I do use H5P for in-class interaction, but it tends to be, um, so I create an H5P element before and I have it in a website. I share the link with students. And so they're exploring something live. For example, some of the um, different image, uh, image content types 
allow you to have different images blend together. And so students are able to um, shift along and kind of see something happening that it can be harder for me to um, just show in person when I want students to be able to really explore like, okay, what happens when I change this parameter, that parameter, and the image is changing to show them what's happening. Simon, I think you've used H5P during class as well. Can you share what you've done? I'm trying to think now how I've used H5P during class. That's noticeable difference? Oh. Yes, the, the, so in class, what I do is that I I find within PowerPoint, it's a little bit of a clunky workaround, but um, I, you know, often in psychology introduction, we're talking about the history of psychology. And so I will create a timeline that then I can embed directly into my PowerPoint presentation and then use that as, which makes my PowerPoints a lot more, um, I don't know, sleek or interactive. It, it just looks pretty cool. And um, then I'm able to link back to my PowerPoints from the slides. Um, and then uh, sort of similar to Siobhan, there's a, a concept called the just noticeable difference, which is basically the amount of um, uh, change in a stimulus that you can detect depends on the context around you. And so that's a little bit more difficult to describe so dryly in, uh, in words. Um, uh, and in class, I can do an actual demonstration with a, a $2 coin and an envelope versus a $2 coin on a book but I created an H5P element where I have a black background and a yellow circle that when you drag goes from slightly dimmer to slightly brighter. And when you do the same increase in brightness, but you've got a white background, it's imperceptible. And so that helps demonstrate some of these things in an online context. And then I've embedded that straight into the book. So someone who's reading through it and is not quite getting it is able to do that activity themselves right there and then. Um, I would also like to just quickly flag up, up Parm, you've done a fair amount of um, workshops and wikis in terms of support. So um, uh, do you have anything additional to add in terms of, of your support? Because as, as far as I understand, that was also somewhat of the side of your desk setting up all of these resources. And then um, if you're happy posting some of those resources in the chat, that would be wonderful. Yeah, um, our unit ended up piloting um, H5P. Um, so I remember our faculty was already using H5P. So when we did the official pilot, we did do some workshops for our faculty. And, and we do have some resources on the ETS website and then also the UBC Wiki. So I can put that in there. Thank you very much. That would be awesome. And we'll stick that up on, on the, the website as well. We're going to move on now from that first kind of getting started part of our panel, um, and we're going to be looking into the student experience with H5P as consumers of the questions, as authors of the questions, and as authors of the questions, uh, sorry, as authors of the questions for helping with the workload of creating things for a course, but also as authors in terms of assessment. Um, and then after that, we'll move on to the final part of the panel, which we've actually ended up touching on already a bit, which is kind of more the tech and sharing um, and analytics side of it. So jumping into the student experiment experience for being question consumers, Alina, this is what um, we're looking to you for. What was your experience like using H5P integrated into a textbook when you were a student in the course? Yeah, so for context, I have the website where the textbook was an online textbook, right? So we had a section of content that you would read just like a normal textbook. Um, but the difference being that because it was an online textbook, there was an integrated H5P portion that was like an immediate check your understanding at the end. And I'd say one of the biggest benefits taking like doing those questions at the end was that it allowed for active reading of that passage and immediate kind of checking in to make sure that you actually understood it in a more interactive way than perhaps just listing the question out and having the student read it and think about it by physically having kind of like a, a multiple choice question or a connecting the dots or a moving things around. It was a much more active way to engage in the material and make sure that you actually understood it. And when I was a student taking that course and reading that textbook myself, I found it um, very, very user friendly and almost like logical thing to do. If the questions had been separate, I might have been inclined, you know, just to have read the passage and move on. But with having the questions right there and having them be so easy with like a, just a clicking the box, you're on your computer already. It's a very simple way to check your understanding. It 
almost promotes the student to do that activity much more so than anything else would. And I, when I was taking the course, did all the questions when I was reading it. And even at the end, before my final exam, went back and just redid the questions to make sure that I still knew what was going on. And it was, I remember being almost wanting more questions because I found them so useful, um, especially given that there's a variety of question types and they're quick and it's not like a big homework set that you have to kind of put yourself in the headspace. You know, I have to do my, my long problem set now and study. It's just a, a little, you know, 20 second question at the end. So you're almost able to review more and review the content right away, which I think really contributed to my retention of the content in the textbook. Great, thanks so much, Alina. Um, so we have students like Alina in a course consuming these questions, but one of the limitations of H5P that we've touched on is the limitation of not necessarily having widespread analytics available. Siobhan, I'm wondering if you can share with us without analytics necessarily widespread available for H5P, how do you assess whether your students are engaging with the material that you make in H5P and whether they're finding it useful? Mm, good question. Um, well, two ways. I, I've been doing uh, some my own kind of uh, SALTO research over the last couple of years. So I do um, entry surveys with my students at the beginning of the course where they haven't engaged at all. And then a check-in in the middle and then an exit survey at the end where they uh, talk about the specific tools and, and, and how they um, help them meet the, the, the learning objectives. And then of course, um, what I do each week, so the, the how I use the H5P is the students do that aspect and it should take them about an hour because it's the equivalent of about one of our lecture hours. Um, so they go through the, the H5P content and then they answer a quiz on Canvas. So um, uh, it, it's just interesting to see, because um, this is where you can look at Canvas analytics and uh, see how much time students spend. And it's very clear to see uh, those who spend more time their Canvas quizzes are because they're pretty straightforward. They get 100% easily because the, um, the Canvas quiz is simply a mirroring of the answers that they would have done in H5P. So if they do those, if the H5P interactive, they simply have to put the answer into the quiz. So yeah, the, the, the actual research I'm doing, the, the Canvas quiz, and then just honestly asking students, you know, like it's like, um, so this, you know, this week we're talking about ecological, uh, political ecology. Uh, it's quite a difficult concept. Um, uh, can you, like, what did you learn from the, uh, the interactive content on H5P? Uh, was it useful? So also just anecdotal qualitative as well. Yeah. So you've mentioned surveying your students before and after your course often. Have you seen any changes in outcomes since you have integrated H5P? Yeah, definitely. Uh, students certainly, I mean, I can't say 100% that the, their knowledge of the content has changed, but what definitely is evident from the, from the survey, uh, and the survey includes both um, like quantitative multiple choice answers and then space for them to articulate is just the sense that they feel that they are more engaged with the course and especially a first year course. And especially back to Simon's question earlier about online teaching, especially that we're in an online environment. They have, I, you know, not to be blow my own horn here, but comments like, with so much being online, this course was a joy because I didn't feel like I was just watching hours and hours of TV. You know, like I actually felt like I was participating. Uh, and that's thanks to H5P. I'm not, you know, gonna take credit for, for that. <laughs> so it, it's, um, yeah, the, the, those kind of comments come through um, on the survey, on the qualitative part of the survey. But then just simply like I have a scale of like, how um, was the H5P, the interactive content, useful to your learning? And overwhelmingly, over 90% find it incredibly useful. Yeah, and, and the only frustrations they have are usually that they then have to go into Canvas and do a separate quiz. <laughs> I'm like, doing it twice will help you remember it. Yeah. 
That's it's so wonderful to hear that you're um, receiving feedback like that. And I think it's one of the things too that can help when when you think about the time input that has to go into creating these sorts of things often that by surveying students and getting feedback that that helps it not just be, you know, putting work out into the void and knowing whether or not it is, it is helpful in that way. Um, all right. So now we're looking at uh, the benefits of students. A show of hands, how many of you um, uh, are students or have worked with students to author H5P content? So um, okay, so then uh, Alina and Kaylee, so for the two of you, for student-faculty collaboration on question authoring, uh, what was the learning curve like, not only in terms of using H5P, but um, sort of creating the question itself and then creating it in a way that can be embedded in H5P, and sort of how much, how much time did onboarding and training take, and uh, was it worth it? So um, Alina, if you could quickly speak to that, and then Kaylee. For sure. So um, in terms of I guess how we kind of approached this given Kaylee had experience working with H5P before and then she trained me on, on the software. Um, I The learning curve essentially looked like we would in initially work on the problems together and I would provide more feedback in terms of like what I thought the question design should be um, and was just, you know, watching her essentially actually do the, the preparation of the question. And then I would, after I kind of was, saw how to do it and had seen how to prepare the questions. Um, I had a little bit more autonomy and was able to design questions outside of our meetings and then bring those to Kaylee and then Kaylee would give me the feedback. So the role kind of reversed in that sense once I get, was a little bit more familiar with how to use the software. And then, yeah, I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Kaylee, before. No, I think that really covers it. I, I think exactly what Alina said is what I found quite fun about it, which was at the beginning, it was more um, collaborative in the terms of like me making the questions with Alina coming some with feedback from a student perspective. And it, and in our later time working together, she'd show up and be like, I had this idea and I created this thing in H5P. And I think, wow, I've never thought to use H5P to do something like that. So she started bringing a lot of creativity with it as she got comfortable with it. So that was a, a great benefit of working with someone else is just having another uh, creative mind in there of um, how you, we could use new, uh, especially when there were new content types that were coming out. Alina was exploring them and seeing how they could apply to the course. For sure. That exactly. specifically being the branching scenario that she was the first, uh, <laughs> she was uh, exploring it for us when it first was released. The, the choose your own adventure type question was, was my, my question that I designed. Um, and then in terms of how often we would meet in our meeting structure, we were just meeting once a week for over the course of one term and then subsequently the subsequent year, another term. So it wasn't like it took hours and hours and hours of time. It was an hour a week. Or I can't remember, an hour to two hours a week that we were kind of meeting and touching base. Um, but I think we were able to kind of create a lot of really cool content together over the course of that time frame. Uh, fantastic. Um, that's that's really good to hear that it doesn't take a lot and that there's not a lot of onboarding and that it tends to maybe be a little bit heavier at the front, but then you can take things and, and you can run. So in terms of having a successful um, faculty student collaboration and getting efficient, high quality questions, do you have any any tips for people who want to, to, to do this, but don't necessarily know where to start? For me or Alina first? Um, let's, since you've got your mic on, let's, let's ask you, Katie. Sure. So uh, in terms of our workflow, it worked in various different ways. Um, so sometimes it was, I'd say most of the time, um, Alina before our meetings had put a lot of time into going through student feedback because on all of our, um, it, online textbook pages at the bottom, there's a little feedback section for every single page. And so she was going through all of those to see where students were saying that the questions were frustrating or anything that they didn't like. She was looking at what they said they did like so we could make more of it. And she was also reading through and seeing where she thought that we didn't really have enough practice for students or where they were indicating, hey, can we have more practice for this part? So she would be coming with um, the needs each week. And then our meetings were very much um, working meetings where we would come up with ideas and at the, at the beginning, um, uh, of our meetings where we would come up with ideas and we would actively be making questions there. I'd say that one of the things that is most challenging about implementing H5P is the workload because of course making anything 
um, any content and especially trying to make it with any form of quality takes time. So for me being teaching multiple courses and having projects on the go, I found it very hard to dedicate time to creating more H5P content, especially since, um, after say my TLEF grant had ended. And so what I found really helpful about working with Alina was that there was this dedicated time in my calendar that when she was there, I knew I was going to make progress on H5P stuff because she was coming with ideas and we were going to do it right there and get something done. So I found that super helpful because I think if I wasn't working with Alina, I just wouldn't have continued to make questions because something would have felt more important in that hour um, if, if we weren't working together. So that was super helpful for me to continue to develop um, content. Yeah, and I think just to add on to that, I think we I can confidently say that we did make a lot of progress, even in that small one hour a week to two hour a week meeting, where I remember the the textbook when we kind of started on it had did have some gaps where we had a lot of the whole textbook was written, but pages would be missing a practice problem at the end, um, like Kaylee mentioned, or they wouldn't have um, very, you know, a very thorough flushed out answer and or question. And then by the end of um, our work together, I think the textbook, every single section had at least one question on it. Um, so there was at least one check your understanding interactive page 5P on every single page of the textbook, um, which I think is an incredible amount of progress, despite it was you know, not, not a crazy amount of input. I mean, I was working on my own time for the meetings in preparation um, to, to an extent, but it wasn't, wasn't anything. I mean, I was enjoying my work with it. And from the student kind of learning perspective, I think I gained a ton and just so much from, from working on that too. So for me, kind of contributing from as a student to a book that I had just used the previous year in my course, um, it allowed me to just kind of experience it from, from kind of a teaching perspective as well as just get so much out of it. So it was, I think, a great experience from both sides. That's, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Um, fantastic to hear both of those, um, the sides of, of, of the coin. Now, a, a question for Siobhan, and then I don't know, Stephen, if you have anything to add on top of this, and this is Siobhan, something that is a, a question I stuck in here, because I'd love to hear. We've been talking a lot about how H5P can be used for formative assessment to practice types of things, but I understand that you've actually also used it for as a summative assessment as part of um, being assessed for the course. Um, how how have you gone about doing that and what should one keep in mind when setting up these types of um, assessments? Um, I've used it with uh, my fourth years, it's like integrated again into tapestry. And um, so it's my fourth year geographies of the Middle East course where they create a digital story uh, of a project that they're researching on. And they have the option of embedding H5P content. Um, so it's optional. Um, the advice I would give, and I only tried it for the first time, uh, didn't teach the course this year, so last year. Um, again, uh, it does take a lot of support from the team, and Stephen and, and Aiden are, are amazing. And, uh, and also, I was certainly, I would be a little bit more hesitant to uh, try it with a 100 or 200 level course at the moment. This is a 400 level and with, I had 30 students, so I certainly could support them. And, you know, I had the time and, and the capacity to do so. But I will say that as in the same way that students um, love feeling engaged um, in terms of the, you know, the formative, like them being feeling like they're part of the course and the it, same thing, the students just love the ability to create and to have, then to have something at the end to show and that lives on. So I, I keep all of these in tapestry and they live on for the next group of students to look at um, and to engage with. So yeah, that, that, that's, it's a very minor piece um, that I've done so far. Well, not minor, but you know, experimental I'll say. Um, but it's more the it's worth it when when the students you get the reaction that they just feel that they're being creative they're creating an artifact that will live on beyond the course and something that isn't just a term paper that will go in someone's drawer that sounds really powerful and I can imagine for incoming students seeing hey here's one of these notes created by one of my previous students I could have this type of impact for future students I can imagine is also especially motivating exactly um, 
Stephen, do you have anything to add? Yeah, so um, I, I have used it for summative assessments in the sense that uh, students are creating content, as I mentioned earlier. And I, I just want to mention one uh, thing you want to watch for if you are asking students to create H5P widgets is that you should specify which types. Um, so if you're looking for something that's highly creative, make sure you say which types of H5P widgets. Don't, don't leave them to their own devices because you'll have a whole bunch of multiple choice widgets and that is not too exciting to see. And I would also mention with respect to the previous question, that I mean, there is there is a lot of tension between amount of time that you have to put into the the creation of these widgets, and I would suggest, as Siobhan was suggesting, that you involve students in that creation process by by making them uh, create H five P widgets and sharing them with their classmates, and then allow you know with their permission, allowing that content to live on uh, past the the particular class session that they're taking. Um, it, it bypasses a lot of the con uh, content creation bottlenecks that you would run into if you were trying to do this all yourself. And it also makes them feel like they're active contributors in the class. Yeah. That's my cat, sorry. <laughs> a wonderful addition to the panel. So Siobhan and Stephen um, have both spoken about when students are creating these questions that they are kind of able to live on um, and, and continue to be reused. I'm wondering, Simon, when you are creating content, do you have an eye to that? Do you turn on the embed function on your H5P elements? Do you assign a Creative Commons license? Uh, yes, I uh, sort of one of my main goals with using open education um, uh, resources is to make things open and uh, affordable and accessible. And, you know, there's the videos, these branching interactive videos that I've that we've created um, take a lot of time and so not everyone may have that time and so just trying to make it as freely available as possible for me is very much within the um the the, the, the for me personally at least it's very fits within my open education philosophy so i i turn on the embed um the embed function and i um I think I use the second most free Creative Commons licenses that it's only attributions required that people can remix, they can download, they can reuse however they wish. And Novak, in terms of making questions that um, are Creative Commons or, or remixing others' questions for Creative Commons, are there any plans to be integrating U the UBC-based H5P authoring tool with any form of repository? Is that currently on the roadmap? Um, so for the, specifically for the H5P content or, well, yes. Um, uh, so we do plan to basically have a front face to all of the content that is being tagged as for sharing and also have a CC license associated with it, but also other content as well. Uh, if people would like to, you know, feature it on the website. Uh, and that's why we sort of have taxonomies such as the academic disciplines as well as the faculty. So people can quickly kind of go through things and look for the, let's say, a certain academic discipline within, for example, faculty of arts. Uh, so in terms of the, the front uh, sort of facing pages, uh, we have a couple of places that we use as inspiration and we are hoping to do better. Uh, we are also looking into kind of the wider open initiative where we do have a, a, a different types of open content available from textbooks to other stuff and looking into how can we sort of make sort of more holistic approach to open content at UBC where H5P is just one category of open content, but also without compromising the ability to quickly locate the H5P content that you might be interested in. So kind of between these two requirements, one promoting the open and, and put it under the same umbrella to also being able to quickly find and reuse content. We're trying to sort of work on that. And that's definitely one of the things that we are definitely committed to. That's that's not, that's yeah, that's a solid part of the roadmap. All right, thank you very much, Novak. Um, we're gonna move into our, we've got 10 more minutes left. Um, so we're gonna move into our last section and uh, we highlighted a couple of questions in terms of technology and tech support. Um, so, Palm, I'd like to ask you, please, um, how can one author H5P elements other than using H5P.com or UBC's H5P hub? Are there other ways that we can go about using H5P? Uh, yeah. 
So the wiki page that I sent the link has a nice little outline about the different ways to use it. So there is the, the um, h5p.com, we've got our open hub, our faculty of education has our WordPress instance. There is a third party tool called Lumi. So you can download that. Um, you can actually download existing H5Ps and then edit them and then um, upload them to wherever you like. Um, that is a third party tool. So um, it, it was a little bit stable about a year ago. It's been pretty stable right now. Um, it's the H5P format. It's it comes down, downloads it, it opens up, and it doesn't look very different. There doesn't do any changes. So the H5Ps remain intact. Um, it's pretty intuitive software. It's not very complex. The nice thing about that is you can actually export it as a SCORM object, and then you can bring that into your Canvas course as an assignment, and then you can collect some grading data. And okay. that varies on the different interaction types. Some of them you can get more robust data, some you don't. Oh, fantastic. So you would be able to download from you uh, from Lumi as a SCORM package and then embed it as, a, as an assignment, and then the student's completion of that can then count towards their grade? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, so talking about grades and, oh, sorry, talking about Lumi, talking about all these different ways in which we can create H5P content, uh, specifically from a UBC perspective, Novak, if someone has been at UBC and they've been ordering H5P content in other places, should they move their content to UBC's open H5P tool? Well, yeah, that's a great question. I have to say, I'm not familiar with with uh, with other places outside of the H5P uh, dot org. Uh, so I guess I guess the benefit of using UBC is is that it's it is sort of designed to serve kind of the higher ed context, and uh, and also the fact that we are listening to to audience and trying to kind of create a roadmap that is meaningful. Uh, so I, I would say yes. I mean, uh, I also have to say that it's early days. We are literally like, we are still under the soft launch, you know. So yes, I think it would be, I, I wouldn't completely shut down my previous install of, or, or place that I was hosting the HYP content, but I would definitely give uh, UBC's HYP a try because I think it is, you know, it is a good environment and hopefully you'll make it better. Thank you very much, Novak. Um, so, you know, we, we're coming up to the end of the panel and I, I had a, a closing question. Usually when you do a, a quick closing a panel, you try to do a quick closing question where each panelist says something, but we've already answered it. Uh, the question was, uh, the goal of the symposium is to get started. So do you have any advice for what you wish you knew when you got started or how to get started? And um, so if I may just paraphrase, Siobhan gave some really good advice on um, be very uh, strategic about why you are using it. Sort of um, H5P is the tool, it's not the master. So make sure that you are aware of why you're using it. And um, I suppose we have these afternoon sessions from 1 to 3 p.m. built in where you can get started, you can start playing around and we have one-on-one -on -one um, expert interactions, um, uh, expert consultants that you can ask a lot of these questions to. Um, so I would really like to thank the panelists. Um, usually this is the time where we would hand out some flowers to say thank you very much or chocolates or something like that. We do have some gift cards to thank you for your time and we'll be contacting you um, and passing those on. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. Um, it feels like we could actually go on for another hour and a half just talking about this um, but we really appreciate your value, uh, your time and your expertise and your knowledge and your willingness to share this. We are going to go into our second studio in 10 minutes time. So at 10.35, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, some of the other H5P contents that are a little bit more advanced, creating essay questions, branching interactive videos. And um, so I think it'd be, let's give ourselves a quick 10 minute refresher break and we'll see everyone back at 
10.35. Once again, thank you to all our panelists and we'll see you soon.